We continue our Q&A series today with two questions. One from Mary on whether to incorporate in California or Wyoming. And another one from Bonica about how to build financial independence and set out your asset allocation plan when you live in Sri Lanka. Welcome to the Radical Personal Finance Podcast. My name is Joshua Sheets, and I'm your host. Today is Wednesday, January 14, 2015. Thank you for being here. Let's boogie on to the second question for today, and it comes from Banaka in Sri Lanka. Here you go. Hey, Joshua. My name is Banaka, and I've got a few questions for you. I've pretty much gone through every episode of the podcast, and I love what you're doing for the community. So I'm 20 years old and I run a small digital marketing company and I'm involved in a few startups. I'm from Sri Lanka. If you don't know, it's a small country close to India. So the living expenses aren't really that high and I manage to save a couple thousand dollars every month, around 80% of what I make. I've been saving a bit since I was 18, but I only started investing seriously from last year. I have around $20,000 so far of my total portfolio saved up. Most of them are in term deposits, kind of like bonds. Now, since our rate of inflation is around 4 to 6%, the term bonds you can get are anywhere from 6 to 9%, depending on the period of years. I generally go for the five-year bonds. So I've dedicated around 50% of my portfolio into these bonds. And then I have around 30% of my money as loans where I give out to people who I know can and will pay me back for around 15% interest. And the other 20% is in seeding a few small-scale startups. I know you would tell me to have 100% of my allocation in a all-stock portfolio, and I get that. Being in the United States, the stock market is fairly efficient, and you can index in a company like Vanguard for a few basis points. I share the same opinion as you in terms of education. I dropped out of my final exams around two years ago, and I kind of gave up on the whole school system and started reading books on personal finance, economics, marketing, and business, and a ton of biographies. I'm still unaware of how I should have my asset allocation. There's tons of financial literature for the US market, but for third world countries and emerging markets, it's a very different story. Here, our stock market is manipulated and all the blue chip stocks are overvalued, extremely overvalued. I'm not sure whether investing in the stock market is a good idea. We have an index fund like the S&P 500. However, the brokerage firms that handle those Indexes take around 2% of the fees right off the top, which is quite ridiculous. It's actually higher than a managed fund that you could get in the States. I want to have something like the old seasons portfolio from Anthony Robbins' new book, Money Master the Game, so I can reduce the time I spend with my investing side and maximize the time I spend with my employees and growing my company. But I'm still not that sure. I know the question isn't something you can give a direct answer to, but say you were in a wildly inefficient market, which is being manipulated day in and day out, would you put your money in it or would you take the less risky approach? Also, I've sent you an email as well because I think I can help you out a bit with all the tech stuff on your show. And anyway, thanks in advance, and I love the fact that you do this hour-long daily show. I just go out for a walk, and when you miss out on a show, I don't get any exercise. So keep up the daily dose of Joshua. And sorry for the long question. <laughs> thanks, Monica. It's, uh, <laughs> I, uh, we're going to call this the diet of radical personal finance. Not the diet, the, uh, the exercise regime of radical personal finance. Go and listen to the show while you walk. I like it. Uh, it's a good idea. I should do that myself. I'm trying to walk more and <laughs> maybe I need to just listen to my show every day while I walk. Uh, it's a great question. And I love questions like this. I love them because they help me to think. I enjoy traveling, and as I travel, I'm always asking myself the question, or I'm often asking myself the question, what would I do if I lived here? How would I build wealth if I were here in this cultural context? What would I have to do? 
And I find this to be a very searching question because it exposes certain realities that uh, you're not, I think, in tune with if you don't travel a little bit. So, for example, uh, for years I operated under the assumption that much of the world was very much like the United States. And in the United States we have this uh, cultural ethic of essentially bootstrapping our way up, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Anybody can do it with enough grit and determination and achieve the American dream. And this is culturally built into us. It's it's fading a little bit, uh, especially a lot of people are <laughs> intentionally, I think, fading it. Uh, and is it completely true? Is it not? I don't know. Uh, but I do know of all the places I've traveled, it's more possible in the United States than anywhere else I've seen so far. Uh, hopefully that will spread. But one of the things I learned as I've traveled is that it's maybe not quite the same in other cultures. And that was a big shock to me when I realized I had to account for certain realities, certain you know corruption, societal caste systems. I had to account for certain things. And it made me come to the conclusion, well, I, w I won't go into long-winded ways, but sometimes uh, it's not possible. And I'm just kind of like, I have no idea how I would do it here, and I would just leave. <laughs> Uh, you know, if I were living in, in this is one I've traveled a good bit in, in Central America, and I admitted to myself, if I were living here, trying to make it here, I wouldn't. Uh, I would probably uh, sneak up to the United States, and I would, uh, you know, we, I would, I'd get into the U.S. And there's no possible way for people to immigrate and follow the law. It's very frustrating. I would, I'd be one of those, I think, probably who would just simply ignore it and get in and and get started and deal with it later. Um, I don't know. It's kind of hard to figure out, and you don't know until you're actually in those situ those situations. But my point is, I love questions like this because. It forces me to expose some of the principles that are consistent across cultures. Sounds to me like you're doing an amazing job already. It really does. F to be 20 years old and to be able to save a couple thousand bucks a month and to have about $20,000 saved up, I assume that's U.S. dollars, uh, equivalent U to U.S. dollars. And to be running a small tech company and be involved with some small scale startups, <laughs> what more do you want, man? <laughs> that is phenomenal. That's more than I was doing at twenty years old. So you're uh, you're way far you're way ahead of where I was, and I love that. I I I hope we can get lots of people ahead of where I was. That's what I want to do. But I do want to give you some thoughts regarding the asset allocation question. I'm probably a bit weird as somebody who formerly managed investment portfolios and formerly sold investments in that I really don't have the same allegiance to publicly traded securities as many people do. I view the stock market, you know, publicly traded securities, as simply one competitor for my money. And if... Home Depot or if ExxonMobil or if Walmart Corporation want my money, they've got to compete for it along with every other opportunity that I have. And they're going to offer certain advantages and certain disadvantages to other things. I don't think that investing in publicly traded stocks is the most efficient, the quickest, the most effective way of building wealth. And my evidence for that is simply that of all of the biographies or uh, short ske character sketches and stories of people who build wealth over time, I've almost never read or met somebody personally. I've almost never read of a very wealthy person that built their wealth by having a well-diversified stock portfolio. It does happen if you give it enough time. And this is why it is so important to get started early. I mean, just the compounding effect that time can have is is truly phenomenal. At 20 years old, if we, you know, let's say we, let's just say have 20,000 bucks, let me give you an idea of the idea of the amount of wealth that you could have. If we put in 20,000 bucks as our starting point, and I give you uh, 40 years of investing, and I give you $2,000 of monthly contributions to the account, and I give you a 10% rate of return, then uh, at the end of, ah, my calculator's in the wrong mode. 
I got to get it out of scientific notation. Okay, so two thousand dollars a month. Here we go. Okay, forty years, ten percent interest annually. Uh, switch to monthly. Twenty thousand dollars of our starting value, and uh, two thousand dollars per month. If we could average a ten percent annual rate of return, that's thirteen point eight million dollars that you could be of wealth that you could have at the age of sixty. Uh, that's pretty astounding. You mentioned that you are lending money out for uh, about fifteen percent return. Let's just put in fifteen percent and let's see what that number would be. You're up to about seventy million dollars at the age of sixty if you could average fifteen percent over uh, your investing lifestyle. And those are, that is in nominal terms, not in real terms. So I'm not adjusting that for inflation. So that's seventy seventy million dollars not adjusted for inflation. That is so powerful. And what is so amazing about the one of the reasons what one of the things that uh, makes public traded security is so valuable is the fact that, as you said, in the United States, we're spoiled that we can trot down to Vanguard and for 25, 30 basis points, pick up uh, an all an all stock, uh, uh, what's it called, the all total market index fund. And you can essentially figure, you know, probably somewhere in that uh, somewhere in that eight to 11 percent rate of return, depending on the coming decades. And that becomes your proxy. And so you can, it's very motivating to tell a 20 year old, look, you could have, uh, you know, 13, 15, 20 million dollars just simply by doing what you're doing. And you don't have to be a genius. There's no management expertise. There's no investing expertise. There's no, uh, there, there's no specific genius. It's just a commodity product that you can essentially buy. And it is certainly subject to market forces. It's certainly subject to economic cycles. It's certainly subject to uh, various risks. But that is an amazing product. And so it's very useful to have that as a competitive solution. But I still go into the fact and say that very few people build massive fortunes with simply by simply investing in publicly traded securities. The people who do build massive fortunes usually started very young or youngish. They also usually had a high paying job. And that was what allowed them to invest $2,000 a month. And so we've got to first smoke that out. And if somebody just wants to have a high-paying job and invest in, in stocks and toss it all in an index fund and go surfing every day, man, that's the easiest, most straightforward approach that you could take. And, and it's one of the few things that's truly passive. Uh, I am convinced everyone's on this relentless hunt for the elusive passive income. At the moment, I'm convinced that there is no such thing as passive income except the ability to live off of dividends and, and growth in stock value of publicly traded companies that you don't have to be involved in managing. What your online business isn't going to do it, your uh, your you know, your blog isn't going to do it, your book isn't going to do it, your real estate, none of those things are truly passive. Uh, but Walmart dividends being paid to me can be truly passive. All I got to do is once a year, pull out my little annual report, read it every year, and just make sure we're not heading down the tubes. And if we do, I sell. <laughs> uh, Coca-Cola only and living off of Coca-Cola dividends, that is truly passive. So uh, let me stay on track here. The problem with this is, so, okay, so we view investing in publicly traded securities, and we have this option in the United States that is a competitive option. So it gives us a benchmark against which to, 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 uh, compare other solutions. But the challenge is that has become the language that's applied to investing. So the whole point of managing large investment portfolios, that's all pension management. And so this language of essentially pension fund management has been applied to what everybody thinks of as investing. So asset allocation, when people say asset allocation uh, or diversification, they immediately think, well, I need to put you know, 30% of my uh, money into large cap U.S. stocks, 20% into mid cap, you know, 10% into small cap, 10% you know, into international, blah, blah, blah. Or if they think diversification, I need to own 167 different firms. And we immediately think in terms of pension portfolios. Uh, that's valuable. But that's not so useful to somebody like you who's building a business and trying to say, what asset allocation do I, do I focus on? 
Uh, I do want to correct, or I just want to clarify one thing. The reason I say all stock, all, all stock for young people, is simply due to the fact that over time, being an owner of businesses, I believe, will have a higher total rate of return than being a lender to businesses. But it doesn't. It's not a blanket statement. It's just simply that for that section of my capital, I want to be the owner of businesses and not the lender. So uh, it's not a blanket statement. But that's that's why. Uh, what would I do in your shoes? Well. <laughs> If I've got $20,000 sitting around, I'm just simply looking to invest it wisely. And based upon what you described to me, I wouldn't be putting a Sri Lankan index fund or probably a Sri Lankan mutual fund of any kind at the top of my list. You're right. The I don't know anything about investing in a Sri Lankan context, but I'm certain that the market is not as efficient or as well-regulated or as transparent as is the U.S. Uh, stock market. So I wouldn't start there. But what I would say is I would say, what are my best opportunities right now? And I would be open to any and all opportunities. But you got to filter them through saying, what can, you, what can I do and what are the risks and what are the rewards of, of each one of them? And I'm going to come back to the asset allocation question in a second and talk about how we apply the principles in your context. But if I've got $20,000, I, I would well, I would start by just looking around and try to figure out who are the wealthy people where I live? Who are the wealthy people in my town, my city, my country? And try to figure out what did they do to get wealthy? And then decide, am I, do I want to follow or am I equipped to follow a similar path? Now, in the United States, we have a well-worn path to wealth, which involves entrepreneurship. This is how people in our culture get wealthy. Go to any elite private school, any elite boarding school, and the majority of the families there, if you, I was looking through my high school um, yearbook uh, pictures the other day, and I was just struck by how, you know, you do these uh, uh, ads in the back. In the United States, we have these yearbooks, and they, and they sell ad space in the back. And I was just struck how... Many of my classmates in high school, their parents were business people, and it was you know it was Joe Smith's exterminating company, and it was uh, Jim John's uh, uh, painting company, and it was uh, Karen Jones' uh, drywall company, and it was just all of these companies, and these are the people who are spending the the you know the fifteen thousand twenty thousand dollars a year to put their kids in private school. That should be the indication. It wasn't necessary, and it was in the professions as well. So in the United States context, we look at entrepreneurship as a business owner and a high paying profession, um, medical specialty, architectural specialty, law specialty, engineering things like this. Now in your culture and context, I don't know what it is. Uh, it might be a similar thing. So you might look around and say, well, all the wealthy people in my town are here because uh, they are, um, you know, because they're business owners. Or it might be that you look around and say, all the wealthy people in my town are wealthy because they're in the mafia. Uh, I don't, don't know if there's a Sri Lankan mafia, but there certainly is in many countries. And that becomes how you get wealthy is with uh, corruption, being a member of government. Uh, the way to get wealthy in some places, if all the Soviet Union, the way to get wealthy was be in the government and, and take all the government, uh, all the stuff that was from the dissolving government. That was how you got rich. And so that's a way of life in some sectors of the world. And you've got to decide, am I willing to play that game? I wouldn't. I'd leave. I'd go find somewhere else where I could do it with uh, my own uh, my own ability. So look around and just see what is working already. What are the wealthy people doing here? And then do you want to do that? The wealth, wealth leaves clues. If you follow those clues, unless something substantial has changed, there's no reason why you, can't, why you have to reinvent the wheel. You can just simply follow the same process that has worked for other people. Now, for you, it sounds to me like wouldn't isn't the best place that for you to invest simply the business that you're already investing in and what you're already doing? Aren't there some massive opportunities for growth there in your specific business? Frankly, I don't know what the scale is of your business, but 20000 bucks, at least to me, doesn't sound like anywhere near enough to where I'd consider investing in anything except just keeping it in cash. Uh, or some sort of cash equivalent. If you can find a cash equivalent that can uh, maintain pace with inflation, that would be ideal. So maybe that's your term deposit system. I don't know. 
But if I were 20 years old and running a tech business, it's hard for me to imagine wanting to try to look and say, how can I own shares in the Vanguard S&P 500 index fund through some sort of uh, foreign account? I would be just saying, how can I use this $20,000 intelligently? It's tough for me to imagine a business that couldn't use an extra $20,000 intelligently on some aspect of helping that business grow. I don't know if that should be spent on training for your employees or buying the office building that right now you're just leasing or maybe upgrading all of the office equipment and computer equipment so that your employees can be more efficient or maybe you need to spend it on marketing. I don't need to know I don't know if you need to fly to India uh, to make you know to meet a couple people in the tech space in which you're operating and make some connections for some business contracts and maybe uh, you know, Sub subcontract some work that they're doing. I don't need know if you need to fly to London or San Francisco for a conference to to establish some connection somewhere, or I don't know if you need to buy you know lease out the the uh, the space on the first floor of your uh, uh, your your office building and set up a, a Western style internet cafe uh, or an Eastern style internet cafe or a Sri Lankan style internet cafe. I don't know, uh, but. I'm sure you must have a ton of ideas that you can personally focus on, and you should be just focusing on your ideas because then you can have the confidence of control. Don't get involved in a stock market that you don't trust where it's manipulated and you say, well, the blue chips are highly overvalued. Look for the the, the need that you have and then conduct it in an intelligent way. If you're going to set up a string of internet cafes, and the reason I use that example is I had a friend of mine that was from the Congo. In Africa, or what is, I don't know what the formal name of the country is, Democratic Republic of the Congo or something like that. And he was established, he invested most of his money in setting up internet cafes. It was an extremely profitable business. He was living here in Florida and he uh, was, but he was investing there in the local infrastructure. It was extremely profitable investment for him. So I don't know if that's the idea for you. But apply all the business principles that clearly you're learning about and that you're studying. Uh, Make sure that you're working your way through not just personal finance information, but also business information, that you're starting slow, that you're building your cafes and testing the concepts, doing your market tests in a slow way, diminishing your risk, uh, all of those types of things. Uh, Make sure that you're being careful. Uh, But something like that is probably going to be a better uh, solution for you. I love the idea of your making private loans and private investments in early stage startups there locally. That gives you multiple benefits. It strengthens your social capital there in your community. It allows you to build a network of people with whom you can uh, work together to improve your community. Uh, and so by being known as the person to go to, to for money, people are going to bring their ideas to you that are going to need to be funded. And you have the opportunity to do a little bit of, a bit of uh, small-scale angel investing and maybe uh, really help. And regardless of whether the investments work out uh, massively or not or even profitably, at least that's going to build your social capital and you're going to have a team and you're going to be well-networked there in your community. So that's really that's really great. Um, you know <laughs> – Hopefully, you know, I mean, even that, it's just you'll learn a lot through that process. And I just, I don't know, I just don't get too excited about trying to say, how can I deploy my $20,000 in some other scenario? Uh, maybe you need, I don't know, you know, make sure, hopefully those term deposits are useful, but uh, I would assume in, I don't know if, if uh, I don't know how similar or dissimilar Sri Lankan culture is to Indian culture. I know you're near. I had one friend from Sri Lanka, but I, I was never that well versed in what his culture was like. But in India, you know, you have a, 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 a culture surrounding gold. Gold is highly prized in India. So maybe you should be keeping some of your backup reserves in, in gold. And that's the way that you preserve the purchasing power of your wealth uh, or your reserves and your, your safe assets. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you got to. I don't know what the what it would be in that context. Now, how, what could you apply from the asset allocation theories uh, that you read in all the Western finance literature to your personal scenario? Well, first, apply the concept of which capital towards which goal. Uh, you need to be establishing a specific goal. The way the portfolios are run effectively and successfully is when they are goal focused, one hundred percent. So the investment manager who's in charge of running the California pension system, CalPERS, or uh, the person who's in charge of running the Harvard or Yale endowment fund, they have a clearly defined goal. 
and they are investing exclusively according to that goal and are ignoring everything else. Each one of us should have the same thing. I don't have any reason to pay attention to what the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average does on a day-to-day -day basis because those are not my goal. My goal is not to beat the S&P 500 or to somehow you know, invest in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. I have a goal of building wealth for my family so that I can fund my lifestyle, the, the needs of the things that are close to me, and fund the business enterprises that I believe are important to make an impact in the world. And at different phases of my life, that might look differently. That, excuse me, that might look different at different phases of my life. So all of these external ideas about, uh, you know, external ideas about well, my investment goal is to get this certain rate of return. Why? What's that funding? Money is to be spent. It's not just this arbitrary idea. The reason that the the Harvard Endowment Fund they have a goal of growing their endowment to fund their programs. We have needs as individuals of funding our lives and our lifestyles. So if your goal for your portfolio is, this is the money that I need to, uh, it's profit from my company, and I see some shaky times on the horizon for a small tech company, and I don't need the money here, but I do want to segregate this money aside, and this is going to be my backup stores of wealth. Well, then apply that goal to this $20,000 and say, this is the goal for the $20,000. And then that's naturally going, to, naturally going to lead you in a certain direction. It's probably not going to lead you to be involved in a manipulated stock market. It might lead you to keep 10000 bucks in gold coins in a, uh, you know, a safety deposit box three towns over or in the next country over. It might lead you to investing, you know, buying a little farm in the country as your backup place in case you're, you know, I don't, I don't know. It might lead you to keeping the money in cash. It might lead you to, to investing it in uh, a real estate opportunity in India. Or, or again, I, I'm so limited as far as my knowledge of that um, aspect of the world. I'll come visit you when I come to Sri Lanka. I'd love to come, <laughs> uh, but. Think through the goal. Now, if the flip side is this goal is uh, this is the wealth building for my retirement years, and I just want to tuck this money away so that I can be free to focus on my business, which is what you said in your question. Now, in that scenario, I might look for a different option. You might look for and see, is there anything available to me within my local con cultural context? No. Well, in that case, how can I set up an international brokerage account, and how can I just simply tuck the money into a diversified index fund uh, using a uh, sub-account, a shell account in the United States or in uh, one of the offshore uh, entities in which you could do this and, and invest through uh, into an index fund? You're just tucking the money in there, and you're ignoring it, and that's just the backup of the backup of the backup that's there for your long-term retirement in case your business implodes, your internet cafe is burned down, the real estate shopping you know, center that you developed completely fell apart, and your hotel business you know, was hit by the mafia. Well, that's simple. That makes sense. And so now you've got your goal, and now that will guide you to the proper investment uh, decision. My issue with using the well-taught asset allocation systems as a method for personal finance is that they are applicable to running pension accounts. So as the, the modern portfolio theory and well-developed uh, models of asset allocation, the kind of stuff that probably, you know, uh, the kind of stuff that Paul Merriman is talking about, uh, about how do we tweak a portfolio to give us the highest uh, rate of return over time and the, the kind of stuff that, uh, you know, that I used to do and get involved in. That's really useful for pension accounts. But the reality is we need to apply asset allocation and diversification to every aspect of our life. And that's not well done, I don't think. I don't get it if it is. Maybe someone can explain it to me. But I don't think that's well done when we just apply pension techniques to everything else. Because the idea that we should own a diversified portfolio is true. But the reality is we're always a little bit out of whack with regard to an ideal diversification when you look at our life in totality. If, for example, you are a U.S.-based high school senior and you're graduating, you don't have a lot of money, and you are going to college, well, now you are extremely out – you're extremely undiversified and you're putting all of your time, focus, energy, attention, and money into a college degree. And you are hoping that this investment of four years of your life and into this academic degree has a long-term payoff. But the reality is you're not exposed to other alternative asset classes, and you're putting all your hope in the academic value of that degree. So you're way out of whack. 
as far as a diversified strategy. Now, you graduate from school and you go and you get a job. You get a nice corporate job. Well, now you're completely out of diversification. You're completely undiversified that you only have one source of income and it's based upon your job. So if you're in the oil business and oil takes a dump in oil prices, that's going to affect your industry. And now you might be out on the streets as a refinery pulls back its production and your your little middle management job uh, was you know, changed. So you're, we're always out of, out of whack a bit with our diversification. And so in, in some ways, you've got to apply the principle of it and, uh, but into an individual situation. And it's not as neat as a fancy little pie chart, but it can be applied. So if you're working as a, as a corporate uh, worker, I wouldn't be putting all of my money into the stock of that company because if I'm working for, again, an oil company and I'm putting all of my investment into the stock of that company and my job, I'm woefully undiversified. So I need to, I would be investing in other sectors of the market. But at a young age, we're going to be under diversified. We're going to be everything on our, on our, it's going to be all be based upon our, one income. I feel like I'm struggling to get this concept out. My, my point is take the principle and then look at what are the risks that I face? What are the risks of the portfo- in my, the portfolio of my life? So take the principle of diversification from a well-run pension portfolio and apply that to my life. You need to capitalize on the tech business at this stage to grow your wealth. But then as you're doing, you would want to diversify your wealth out of your business into other businesses and into other investments. That might be purchasing a farm. That might be purchasing an apartment building. That might be doing more term deposits. That might be investing in other companies. So apply that principle that you read about without necessarily working, folk worrying about the 60-40 split. Uh, other principles of, of uh, well, uh, I talked mainly there about diversification. The other principle, asset allocation. What are the best asset classes that I should be investing in right now? So in life, we apply and we say, I'm going to invest in the asset class of my human capacity capacity and my education. Education is a well-paying investment. So that's why we invest in education, whether that means in formal schooling or whether that means in alternative education. Education is a high-producing, high-performing asset class. So especially in the early years, we want to focus on investing into our education and then over time, we're going to diversify out because if I'm 50 years old, I've got less time for my education to pay off. Now it might be time to switch to other things. Something like building out non-correlated asset classes, that's one of the, so the whole feature of the way that portfolio management works when you are sitting there and saying, what percentage in stocks, what percentage in bonds, what percentage in real estate, what percentage in large cap stocks, small cap stocks, the whole point of that, uh, what modern portfolio theory is based upon is the idea that by owning different non-correlating asset classes, we can increase the overall returns with decreasing the risk of the portfolio. That's the, that's the fundamental principle of of, uh, asset allocation planning. So think about that in your life. If you're in the oil business, then I would be considering, okay, if my oil business goes down in value, what are the non-correlating asset classes to oil or tech or real estate? and apply them to our own life within the context of scale. Diversification is important. We look at it within the context of scale. We're always going to be a little bit out of whack with our diversification plan. You know, If I live in the United States and I invest in the United States, well, I'm undiversified when it comes to dollar diversification. So all of my money is earned in dollars. All of my expenditures are in dollars. So what happens if the dollar strengthens? What happens if the dollar weakens? What happens if there's inflation of the dollar? What happens if there's deflation of the dollar? So over time, I might need to diversify. But like I said the other day on the show on scale, that's a waste of time and to even think about if I've got you know five or $20,000. It's completely meaningless. Why should I wor- worry about that? Now, if I've got $20 million, I'm going to be thinking about that. So apply it within your, your context. Um, just look and say, what are my risks? What risks am I, expo- am I exposed to? So ask yourself good questions and clearly label your money. What's my safe money? What's my risky money? What's my investment capital? What's my cash reserves? Why is this Uh, amount of money being allocated towards investment capital? Why is this amount of money being allocated towards reserves? Why these amounts? 
And what, what's my goal? What's my goal for what I'm doing anyway? Am I trying to build up and at 22, I'm going to go travel the world for a year? Or am I trying to build this company for the fun of it? Or is there a number that I'm targeting, a, a net wealth target that I need to maintain my lifestyle? What are my risks? Where are they coming from? Uh, what risks am I comfortable with? What risks am I uncomfortable with? What can I actually afford to diversify away from? What is not? What can I not afford to do yet? So uh, ask yourself these questions. And just by asking these questions and then considering them, consider what answers emerge for you. Um, that's the best idea I've got for you. Let me see if there's anything I didn't answer. Oh, as far as the all seasons portfolio, you can copy that portfolio if you want. Um, I didn't make a big deal out of it. Just one of the cons- I didn't actually even talk much about the portfolio construction um, of it. One of the concerns about that portfolio is uh, just be aware and do some research. Other people have written well about this online. Just do some do some web searching. And one of the concerns is coming off a 30-year bull market in bonds. And so it's pretty heavily weighted to bonds. And is it as good as anything? It's probably as good as anything. Uh, But uh, just do a little research and understand the theory behind it. And then you'll have to figure out how you could actually set it up in your your context. Um, And then share your knowledge. Start a website uh, for Sri Lankan investors looking to implement an all-seasons portfolio strategy to build their wealth and help your other fellow investors out. I think that's all I wanted to cover on today's show. Uh, I thank you all for listening. Uh, dude, Bonica, thank you so much for getting in touch with me from Sri Lanka. And for those of you who are in international audiences, I thank you for listening. I, I never even dreamed when I started this show that I would have an, an international audience. Uh, it makes me just think a little bit about, uh, you know, how can I, <laughs> I... I feel a little bit bad that so much of my content is so U.S.-centric. And uh, and I think about, well, how could I provide more value to an international audience? Uh, I guess it's hard for me to know how to do that. I, I'm, I'm an expert on U.S., U.S., you know, the U.S. context. Uh, but, you know, I'm just so limited as far as my knowledge of anything outside of the U.S. context. Uh, so I hope that I'll keep trying to bring value of some of the general ideas. And, <laughs> and if I can think of a way to serve the international audience more effectively, I would love to do that. I just, I just don't know how to do it. Uh, but it's, it's so humbling to think that uh, there's, there's a listener in Sri Lanka. I never dreamed that when I was uh, starting the show. It's, that's, that's pretty humbling. So thank you all so much for listening. If I could, um, as I close today, well, uh, just want to reduce my iTunes reviews. If you like today's show, make sure if you're not subscribed that you subscribe uh, to the show in iTunes. Uh, I want to ask you uh, for a favor. If you haven't left a review for the show, would you take a moment and leave two sent- a two-sentence review for me? That would mean the world to me. You can find it very easily right in iTunes. And at the moment, I have uh, a total of 60 written reviews for the show. And I would love to get that number to 100. Uh, that would just really, really help. Reviews matter when people are looking through shows and they look and they read a few reviews and they see the number. And so even if your review is only a couple of sentences. I would appreciate it. It can be good. It can be bad. It can be one star, one, five star. I read every one of them. Uh, as we go today, I want to read another one here from Zikarik. Uh, it says, I, uh, this podcast is incredible. I discovered this podcast about two weeks ago and I was instantly hooked, packed with useful and informative information. I'm fairly new on my journey to financial independence and Joshua has been able to provide shows that are thought provoking and extremely interesting, keeping ideas simple and adding technical details simultaneously. I've discovered a vast amount of provoking and extremely interesting uh, I've discovered a vast amount of additional useful resources through his discussions, interviews, and the show notes. Uh, His shows do not provide answers. They present multiple sides of financial issues and give the listener ideas and resources to discover the right path for themselves. A wealth of knowledge. Incredible. Keep it up, Joshua, and thank you. Uh, Thank you for that review. I appreciate that. If you'd like to get in touch with me, email me, joshua at radicalpersonalfinance.com. And uh, if you would like to support the show, please do so by joining the Irregulars program. That is the way that you can support the show and allow me to keep doing this. I'm out. Cheers, y'all. Thank you for listening to today's show. This show is intended to provide entertainment, education, and financial enlightenment. Your situation is unique, and I cannot deliver any actionable advice without knowing anything about you. This show is not and is not intended to be any form of financial advice. Please develop a team of professional advisors who you find to be caring, 
competent and trustworthy. And consult them, because they are the ones who can understand your specific needs, your specific goals, and provide specific answers to your questions. Hold them accountable for your results. I've done my absolute best to be clear and accurate in today's show, but I'm one person and I make mistakes. If you spot a mistake in something I've said, please come by the show page and comment so we can all learn together. Until tomorrow, thanks for being here.